Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for coming and uh, welcome to the Great Migration webinar. Um, I'm overjoyed with the amount of people that we have joining us tonight. Um, so thanks for taking the time to be with us. Uh, my name is Caitlin Burroughs and I'm a Habitat Stewardship Coordinator with Nature Saskatchewan and I will be your MC for the evening. Uh, I'm very excited to be here with you all tonight and to get into the wonderfully fascinating world of migration. I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. So we'll get started in just a few minutes, uh, but first I just wanna go over a few housekeeping items with you. So um, I'd like to introduce um, my coworkers that are here with me tonight uh, that are helping out with the webinar. So we have Emily Putz, Rachel Ward, and Rebecca Magnus. Um, if you guys wanna turn on your video and say hello. There they are, wonderful. Um, so Rachel will be uh, giving a short update on Nature Saskatchewan and the Stewards of Saskatchewan programs. Um, and Emily will be facilitating uh, the Q&A portions um, after the presentation. And Rebecca will be keeping things running smoothly as she's our uh, webinar guru. So she'll be in the background running things. Uh, so you are aware uh, the webinar will be approximately two hours, but the webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. And a link will also be emailed to you as well. So um, if you have any technical or connection issues, or if you need to step away at any time or leave early, not to worry, you'll receive a copy of the recording. Uh, for your privacy and to keep things running smoothly, all attendees are muted and uh, your video is turned off and you will not be able to unmute or turn your video on. We've also um, disabled the chat function, uh, but there is a Q&A function that we will be using tonight. So if you hover over your screen, you should see the Q&A button. And this is where you can type in any questions that you have throughout the evening. And we encourage you to enter your questions throughout the presentation and you don't, you don't need to wait until the end. Um, this will make it a bit easier for Emily to moderate um, and to be able to answer questions more efficiently. And we'll have five minutes after um, the two presentations this evening for Q&A. Uh, if you are having any technical difficulties, um, please just try leaving the webinar and joining back in using the same link. Um, that often seems to fix any glitches there are um, or restarting your computer. If you have any audio problems, um, check to make sure your speakers are turned on and that your computer volume um, is turned up. So we will also um, be having free door prizes tonight to give away. Um, so we'll be giving away two uh, long sleeve shirts featuring a monarch butterfly um, or an Operation Burring Owl 30th anniversary t-shirt which features a Burring Owl sketch. Um, you'll have your choice of either the monarch shirt or the Burring Owl shirt, um, but sizing is limited. And we'll also be giving away a copy of our newest publication, the Backyard Bird Feeding Guide. Um, if you're unable to stay for the whole evening, not to worry, um, you'll still be entered for the door prizes and you'll be notified via email. So make sure to watch for that in your inbox um, or your junk mail, make sure to check that too. And I just wanna plug that uh, all of this merchandise is also available um, for sale on our online store. Um, and all of the, pro the proceeds of the sale of this merchandise goes back to our programming. So please take a moment to, to check it out. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here and I'm going to invite um, Rachel Ward to um, share her screen as she's going to do a little bit of an update on the Stewards of Saskatchewan programs um, and, and where those are at. So Rachel, please go ahead and um, ready when you are. Hi, I'm Rachel Ward. I'm a Habitat Stewardship Assistant with Nature Saskatchewan. 
So I'm gonna give you, as Caitlin said, just a brief rundown on Nature Saskatchewan. So we are a voice for nature in Saskatchewan. Our vision is humanity in harmony with nature. And our mission is to engage and inspire people to appreciate, learn about, and protect Saskatchewan's natural environment. We are Saskatchewan's largest volunteer-driven nonprofit naturalist organization with over 70 years of observing, documenting, and working to protect native species and natural ecosystems. We deliver numerous education and stewardship programs, and we have approximately 600 members and 16 affiliated nature societies. Our main program is the Stewards of Saskatchewan program, where we focus on habitat conservation through landowner stewardship. So we have four main goals. We conserve prairie habitat through landowner stewardship. We monitor populations, increase awareness and knowledge, and promote habitat enhancement and restoration. For habitat conservation, we conserve prairie habitat that is suitable for target species at risk and other wildlife through voluntary landowner stewardship. We currently have 930 participants conserving over half a million acres of species at risk habitat. Our population monitoring is done through a few different ways. We have our census where annual census cards are sent out to those participating landowners asking if they've seen the species that year. We also have our hoot line. So if you ever do see a species at risk, you can call that into the hoot line and we will incorporate that into our population monitoring. So the number is 1-800-667-HOOT. And for our rare plants, that is done through plant searches conducted by the rare plant rescue team for target species on participating properties. So those are done with the permission of the landowners. The search crew will survey the land to seek out those target rare plant species. And this has allowed us to find previously unknown occurrences of target species. And we also do this for population monitoring of known locations. The population monitoring data with landowner permission is then shared with the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center. And there the rare plant rescue data has been able to contribute to downlisting of several species. And our plovers on shore data has contributed to critical habitat identification. And about half of their burrowing owl data actually comes from our programming as well. For education and awareness, this is done through a few different ways, including public presentations, like we're doing here tonight, as well as news releases and articles, ads and posters. And then we do also create resource materials for landowners, such as fact sheets, booklets, and a species at risk newsletter and calendar. And we also hold conservation awareness days or CADS, which is what you can see in the picture here. And as a thank you to our stewards, we do also offer them a personalized gate sign for the program that they're participating in. For habitat enhancement, we are improving and enhancing habitat for burrowing owls, sprogs, pivot, and piping plovers. And that's done with a 50-50 cost share for native seeding, wildlife friendly fencing, or alternate water sources. The wildlife friendly fencing is a four strand fence with bottom and top wires smooth. The highest wire is 40 inches or less from the ground and the lowest wire is 18 inches or more off the ground with the top two wires no less than 12 inches apart. That's, this lets pronghorns crawl under the fence easily while allowing deer to go over the fence and avoid getting tangled in those top two wires. The alternate water sources can provide offsite watering, which helps to reduce disturbance to piping plover habitat during the breeding season. Water development can also be used to help a landowner graze a pasture that they aren't able to as easily without a water source. We have five different stewardship programs. Our initial program, Operation Burrowing Owl, was initiated in eight. 1987, followed by Rare Plant Rescue in 2002, Shrubs for Shrikes in 2003, 
Plovers on Shore in 2008. And in 2010, we created the Stewards of Saskatchewan Banner Program. The Operation Burrowing Owl Program, or OBO, as I said, was initiated in 1987. It currently has 336 participants protecting approximately 162,000 acres and its target species is the burrowing owl. Then we have our rare plant rescue program or RPR, which was initiated in 2002 and currently has 83 participants protecting approximately 148,000 acres. This has 16 plant, plant species, nine of which are federally listed species at risk. Then we have our Shrubs for Shrikes program or SFS, which as I said, was initiated in 2003. This has 275 participants protecting approximately 119,000 acres with the target species, the loggerhead shrike, which is also known as the butcher bird due to its tendency to impale prey items on barbed wire fence or on thorny shrubs. We also have our Plovers on Shore program or POS, which was initiated in 2008 and has 60 participants protecting approximately 137 miles of shoreline. And the target species is the piping plover. If you haven't noticed yet, there is also a young plover snuggled up to the adult there. They're pretty well camouflaged. And then we have our Stewards of Saskatchewan Banner Program or SOS. This was initiated in 2010 and has 176 participants protecting approximately 91,000 acres. And this covers all other species at risk. So this covers species like the monarch butterfly, the northern leopard frog, Sprague's pipit, phryginous hawk, bobolink, and many other species at risk in the province. We are also involved in several other initiatives. We encourage youth to build relationships with nature through our Nature Quest and Inner Nature programs. We also encourage citizen science through Naturehood, Nature Watch, and our role as an important bird areas caretaker network, as well as through our Stewards of Saskatchewan programs. Those are also citizen science. Then we have our publications. So we have the Blue Jay, which is a quarterly journal, Birds of Saskatchewan, and as Caitlin showed on our door prizes, the Backyard Bird Feeding, a Saskatchewan guide is one of our newest publications. There are others as well. And then we also maintain and operate the Last Mountain Bird Observatory, where they monitor number and species of migrating songbirds. And they've been doing that for over 20 years now. We also have meetings or gatherings in the fall and spring where we have presentations and go out to national areas in the province. And thank you for your attendance here today and a big thank you to all of our stewards. The stewards involved in our programs are really the backbone of everything that we do and the reason we've been able to continue for so many years. They're the ones that are managing and care for, caring for both the habitat and the species that call it home. And it's because of their care that many of these species at risk that we deal with still have habitat today. So a big thank you to our stewards and to everyone else here today. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. That was that was really great. Um, uh, next, we're going to move right along here, um, and I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, his name is uh, Dr. Jeff Holroyd. Um, so, Dr. Jeff Holroyd's interest in birds developed as a teenager when he was an active volunteer and chairman of the Long Point Bird Observatory. He earned his Master of Science and PhD from the University of Toronto for his studies of the foraging strategies and diet of swallows. He retired in 2012 after 36 years with the Canadian Wildlife Service and is now chair of the Beaver Hill Bird Observatory. Uh, so welcome, Jeff. 
um, please go ahead and um, share your screen and take it away. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, slight panic here, there we go. Okay, got everyone can see that, I hope. Yeah, it looks good, Jeff. Great, thanks, Caitlin. So welcome everyone, kind of strange giving a talk when there's no one in the room but my dog and I, um, but I'm glad to see so many people are uh, listening in. So the topic tonight, as you may know, is um, about burring owls. And uh, the question is, where did all the burring owls go and why? And most importantly, what can we do? So I'm hoping to uh, fill you in. As you probably already know, burring owls are endangered in Canada and uh, their numbers declined in the 1990s and have never recovered. Uh, oh, I rushed through the first page there. I should also acknowledge my co-author, Helen uh, Treffrey, who has been a longtime co-worker initially on the Peregrine Falcon Recovery Program and then um, on Boring Owls, but she is also retired, uh, but will get mentioned once in a while in the talk. So if we look at what happened in Boring Owls, Operation Boring Owl that you were just told about is one of the key databases that showed us that Boring Owls were in trouble. And you can see the um, growth of the Operation Burring Owl in the first couple of years as the program started. And then by 1990, there were about 1,100 Burring Owls being reported by the landowners. The, many of you folks are still there today. And then a, a crash through the 1990s, a crash that's never uh, recovered. So some people will comment that that's a landowner program. Uh, what did the biologists find? Well, here's a study in the Regina Plain started by Paul James in uh, around the same time, 1987, the red line. He had 78 pairs when he started. Uh, by the time uh, Troy Wallacombe and the uh, Poole and Todd team arrived, uh, uh, Paul James's po study population had declined dramatically. So uh, the other three had to expand their study area to include, find enough birds to actually study but even in those expanded study areas, the populations declined. And I don't know if anyone's even gone looking for them since about 2011, when you had to drive a lot of miles to even find uh, one pair in the Regina Plain. So how big is a burring owl? Many of you probably know, it's uh, roughly a size of a pop can on stilts, um, about 150 grams. So not a big owl, and it obviously lives on the prairies, uh, treeless prairies. Um, the more treeless, the better, as far as the owl is concerned, and then there's less likelihood of predators in the way. Of course, those prairies are also prime land for cultivation, the, the breadbasket, the wheat fields of, of Alberta or, and Saskatchewan. So what do they eat? Well, we tried our owl here and it was not very keen on a, a mouse on a fork, but in fact, uh, that is their primary food, our uh, rodents, mice, and voles. Uh, but also insects. They actually eat more insects than uh, voles and mice. And we have great debates. Are they a, a mouser that takes insects on the side or are they an insectivore who's forced to eat mice and voles uh, when there aren't enough insects around? And I'm probably in the second camp, but it's pretty hard to prove since we've decimated many of the insect populations on the prairies, especially the grasshoppers. So they do uh, live on the prairies and nest on the prairies. Despite their name of burrowing owl, they do not burrow themselves, except in a few unique situations in South Texas and Florida, where they're able to do um, digging and create burrows. On the Great Plains, they depend on mammals, fossorial mammals, to dig the holes for them, um, primarily prairie dogs, where prairie dogs occur. There's a lot of literature say they nest in abandoned ground squirrel holes, which they do, but technically those ground squirrel holes have been enlarged by a badger, a coyote, a swift fox, some other animal before the uh, ground squirrel went in and then the, the, the uh, burring owl took over. So you can see the bottom right there is a classic uh, prairie dog hole in Grasslands National Park. Of course, they have a love-hate relationship with the fossorial mammals. Uh, you can see a variety of the ground squirrels and the likes there, prairie dogs bottom left. Um, a ground squirrel hole will be enlarged by a badger. The owl will move in. 
The problem then, of course, is the badger might come back. So here's a um, camera trap with a pair of burring owls looking concerned down their burrow. Uh, badger pops up. Uh, the male was very brave and actually attacked the badger, but it didn't uh, prevent the badger from eating the young in the nest and uh, making off uh, with a full stomach. So what happens to burring owls uh, on the prairies? Um, we'll get to Mexico in a minute, but first of all, on average, they lay nine eggs. That can vary from six to a dozen, but nine is the average. And if they're having a lot of food and a lot of luck, they can fledge six, seven, or eight of those, typically eight hatch, and then say seven uh, will, will fledge. Um, but uh, in, since the 1990s, and we don't have a lot of data before that, they typically only produce three or four young per nest attempt. So what happens to those young in the burrow is a key component to the decline of the burring owl as you're going to see. So here's some um, data from Grasslands National Park where Helen Treffrey and I studied them up until two years ago when COVID interfered, but fortunately the park staff have picked up the slack as you'll see and kept going. So our long-term average from 1998 to 2015 was 2.9 young per nest attempt. So that includes nest failures, but clearly far short of the nine eggs and potential nine young that are laid in the burrows. And you can see there are some good years, some bad years, but no obvious real cycle to it, but overall low productivity. Uh, likewise, Joe Schmutz did a study in a Hanna area, of central Alberta, southern Alberta, and his average from 86 to 97 was 3.5 young. So there's various other studies, but I won't show you all of them. But uh, part of the solution to what uh, happened to, happens to burring owls came from Troy Wallacombe's PhD in 2003. And so he did a food supplementation experiment. Uh, I was his supervisor and it was quite an exciting study. And you can see um, in 1992, his first year when he fed, um, young in the nest after they'd hatched, there was a slight increase in the number of uh, young fledge compared to unfed pairs. The black bars indicate where he fed uh, prior to laying to see if he could uh, encourage the females to lay more eggs and he had no significant effect. But then in 93, 96 and 98, supplemental feeding of the young produced uh, far more young uh, in the nest than unfed young. So what happens in the nest? Why aren't the unfed young uh, fledging? So those, those are the key years that showed us the difference, the impact of um, feeding, supplemental feeding them. And you can see here, I'm afraid there's a few graphs in this talk. The green line shows about three weeks of age, 20, 21 days of age. And you can see the dotted line is the brood reduction that occurred uh, in the unfed nests. So the dark, the solid lines and the dark dotted line are fed nests and the lightly dotted line are unfed ones. And you can see quite clearly in 92, 93, 96, and especially 98, the brood reduction happens in the nest in the first three weeks. And then if a young makes it to three weeks, the male and ultimately the female can provide enough food that they survive. But that first three weeks is critical and the bulk of the brood reduction, the, basically the death of the young occurs in that time frame. And some of the amazing video that the graduate students at the time found um, was the females will actually feed the smallest young to the larger young to save the larger young. And Ray Poulin and Daniel Todd actually had a video of a adult going to a neighbor's nest, dragging a young out of the neighbor's nest and bringing it back to their nest to feed their young. So they can be pretty brutal at, with each other at, um, when it comes to their nestling starving. So the question when I got involved in 1986-87 was where do the burring owls go? Paul James and others were researching them on the prairies. They were banding them, uh, color banding them and getting very few banded birds coming back. So where did they go? And nobody actually knew um, in the 1980s. So since I was a federal employee and I enjoy cold winters, but I also like warm winters, I volunteered to try and find out. So first we took our captive imprint uh, burring owl, showed him a globe and asked him where he'd like to go for the winter. And that didn't get us very far. 
So then we put the burring owl in charge of driving our vehicle. And after a few narrow misses in the ditches, we decided that really wasn't a good idea either. So then we looked at what data do we have? We can look at band recoveries and you can see the red lines from Saskatchewan, the pile of band recoveries headed south into South Texas, but no winter recoveries. The one winter recovery was the blue line from the Oklahoma panhandle down to near Guadalajara. And one of the messages here is never ignore your first data point because that may in fact uh, indicate where you should be going. And that's the blue line, as you'll see. So first, I went to the Mampimi Mana Biosphere Reserve with Ricardo Rodriguez Estrella. That's in northern Mexico in the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, Ricardo had studied burring owls in the reserve for his master's thesis during the summer and was sure they were staying there for the winter. So we spent two weeks um, surveying this area, put a lot of miles on a rented vehicle and on foot and never didn't find an owl. We did find lots of cactus and we did a lot of walking. These are the uh, salt flats and grass tussocks where the owls nest in the summer. We visited uh, Ricardo's um, breeding sites where the owls bred, where he found them and found none. We did end up because of all the cactus with flat tires in the rented combi that I um, picked up and uh, used for transportation. I actually thought ahead and got a couple of spare tires, but you can only carry so many tip spare tires and we ended up with three flats. This of course was very frustrating and we knew we shouldn't have done it, but we were fed up with the combi. So we did that to it. But then we realized there were about 15 kilometers from the research station. So we started out in, on foot. Uh, we only had one half liter of water between the three of us wasn't long before the vultures were circulating and the outcome was obvious. There should have been laughter there. It's kind of a drag doing a webinar, webinar. So hopefully you got a smile. The reality was we were very exhausted when we got back to the research station, chugging water, relieving our overheated feet and swearing that we would never travel without a big jug of water in the future. We did eventually get all the flat tires fixed and got back on the ground, but we never did find any owls. Um, and then the following year, a um, wildlife manager in South Texas contacted us. He had photographed an owl. And so when we drove down there and got to his office, we blew it up on the wall and we said, we can read the band. And if you look carefully on the right-hand leg of the owl, there's a dark red um, band. And Troy Wallacom had banded a male owl in the Regina Plain, 81918. Uh, with a red band on the right leg. So we were pretty confident that this was uh, Troy's bird in South Texas in the winter. Unfortunately, when we got there, uh, we found a pile of feathers and there were harriers in the area, Northern harriers, and we suspect that a harrier ate our bird, but at least we had a wintering record of a Saskatchewan owl in uh, South Texas, right against the Rio Grande. During the 1990s, we had various graduate students doing telemetry of home range and habitat in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So we took advantage of that, put slightly bigger batteries on the owls with their backpack transmitters, this is VHF telemetry, and then went out to um, South Texas to Rockport. In the middle is one of my other graduate students, Jason Duxbury, who you'll hear about in a minute. We hired the Cessna that flies uh, surveys for hooping cranes to fly in South Texas. And then ultimately with Helen and I, we flew um, 50 kilometer transects from Houston, Texas through to Veracruz, Mexico, and then across to Guadalajara. So we spent about 200 hours in a Cessna, mostly listening to static, hoping to hear the beep beep of transmitters of owls wintering. And we in fact did find some, we also found a lot of uh, cultivated land. A lot of South Texas is now cotton fields. We uh, narrowly missed this volcano. We were the last plane to take off from Puebla before this volcano unexpectedly blew up right behind us. We did find some owls with transmitters. Here's one in South Texas, that's Helen. And uh, the owl was wintering in this cultivated abandoned field when we went back the following winter, that is the same field. So that's part of the story of wintering habitat of burring owls turned into uh, suburban development 
so even if the native prairie wasn't there, at least a cultivated field was useful, but obviously not a, um, a subdivision like this. We found another owl in an orange grove in Veracruz. It had been killed, we suspect, by roadside hawks. There were a pair of roadside hawks overhead as we took this picture, but we were able to retrieve the transmitter and, um, and get another wintering record. And likewise in Michoacan, not far from where the monarchs but uh, butterflies winter, but in the lowland, we found another owl in this thorn scrub cactus patch, along with about half a dozen other owls. So this was very exciting to see owls flushed out of here with no bands and no transmitter, and eventually to, get, to see our transmitter bird uh, and identify it. So that gave us a better idea of where owls were going for the winter, and the one in Michoacan was actually put on in Alberta. So we had our first uh, boring owl recovery from a banded bird in Alberta, um, and none of the previously banded birds had ever been found in the winter. So now we have a better idea of where they are. They're on the coastal plain and in central Mexico. We then started using other techniques. Oh, and somebody's got to remind me to get rid of all the animation here. Jason really liked animation. So um, basically this is looking at the feather chemistry, the isotopes in the feathers, and we can use the ratio of uh, the isotopes of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen uh, plot them on a map and get an idea of where the birds originated. Carbon is particularly important in this process. So we also created, Jason created a carbon map for the Great Plains range of boring owls based on the carbon uh, signature in nestlings. So we took the nestling feathers, processed them, looked at the carbon values and plotted this map and then overlaid carbon with um, nitrogen and hydrogen and, uh, and created this three-dimensional map. And you can see the red area is the target area where we're looking for feathers in the winter to see if they originated in that target red area. And in fact, we, we got quite a few hits. There's what, eight there that we got. So we had to trap owls in the winter in the study areas that we identified from our flying and then take a, a tail feather from each of those owls and then Jason would run them through the mass spectrometer and uh, found that eight of them came from uh, our target area, the breeding range in Prairie Canada. So this was obviously very exciting. You can also see there's um, four green lines that go into the core of central Mexico, uh, and then the one red line from Saskatchewan to near Guadalajara. So that intensified our search for study areas in the, that area. We also, uh, as technology improved, uh, tried to geolocators. They did not work very well because of their, the low nest fidelity of burring owls, and I'll come to that in a minute. So we deployed 14 transmitters. The geolocators keep track of light levels and time, uh, but they don't transmit. You have to retrap the owl. So we uh, deployed 14, but only caught one, and it actually quit the day before Christmas in 2005 but we were able to trace its record from uh, Southern Alberta to uh, near Guadalajara and then into central Mexico. You can see the plot there. And the interesting thing that it showed us, if you look at the dates, it was in Alberta in August. In September, it stopped in Montana. We suspect it did uh, some body molt there, flew then fairly rapidly down into South Texas, spent a month there, then moved on into Mexico in December, and as I mentioned, uh, the transmitter ended the day before Christmas. So it at least gave us a good track record of how quickly owls move, where they stop and where they end up. And then as technology improved, we deployed satellite transmitters, which do transmit data. And uh, the um, company came up with solar powered ones, which is kind of tricky with a burring owl because the owls do spend time underground in the daytime in the winter. So the solar panel doesn't get charged. But we did get uh, some good tracks. The first one that we put on, the bird went south um, pretty much along the edge of the mountains to New Mexico and then very strangely did a right turn over to Baja and spent the winter in the Baja area. That was um, without getting into politics. That was just as Mr. Harper was in power. 
our funding was cut. Helen and I took a holiday and flew down there, rented a car because we wanted to see where this bird was. And it was in the middle of the largest industrial salt mine in the world uh, near Guerrero Negro. By chance, a veterinarian in Guerrero Negro had contacted us because she had seen many burring owls there in the winter. So she actually provided our accommodation and local transportation and permits to visit the salt mine. But this was the very barren habitat this owl was in. There were also occasional shrikes there, lizards, and some insects. So even though it looks barren, I suspect there was enough food. The owl didn't move from the area all winter. Um, we got more hits from other transmitters, all pointing down into central Mexico for their wintering areas. So we had a pretty good handle that the owls we were studying in central Mexico were ones that um, involved Canadian birds. So that um, uh, blue area, oh, sorry about the Spanish. I gave this talk in uh, Puerto Vallarta and I tried to eliminate all the Spanish, but I forgot that one. Uh, so that blue area in central Mexico is what we call the, where the mother load of wintering burring owls are. They are along coastal Texas and Mexico, both sides of Mexico, and obviously at least some go to Baja, but the bulk of the owls and the tracks that we made uh, had them in the um, central uh, valley, the Bajillo of central Mexico, which is between the uh, Chihuahuan uplands of northern Mexico and the volcanic belt where the monarch butterflies winter Mexico City and South. So this is where the uh, where corn was developed, where the Inca Maya um, uh, civilizations existed. Um, it's a very rugged area, some of it. You can see kinds of habitats where we saw burring owls in the winter, not necessarily open grasslands at all. Um, the upper right picture, that elderly gentleman used to collect burring owls for the American Museum of Natural History on that shrubby slope. And he took us where he'd seen owls in younger, when he was younger and couldn't believe there were no owls there. But clearly searching grasslands isn't what all one has to do in Mexico. You've got to look for um, other areas. The gentleman in the center bottom right picture is a school teacher. We talked to his class and it was a very interesting experience. He, at the end of the talk, there were high school students. He said, that's great, but you have to do more for these students. So we took them out and showed them what we were doing. The upper left is a little town of Valencianita in central Mexico. Um, the upper right is a hillside that the Mexican Environmental Authority came along with a giant plow, created these uh, furrows and planted shrubs. They were trying to rehabilitate the hillside and created ideal wintering habitat for burring owls, which were in all of the cavities that the um, plow had kicked up with the limestone. And in the center, you can see the high school students. So we showed them what we were doing. They fairly quickly caught on and we could survey the whole hillside in one pass by having the students all spread out. When we flushed an owl, the two closest people would go to where the roost was. We collect any pellets for diet analysis, record the location. And those students got so good that months where we weren't there, they would go do the survey without us. So the teacher would uh, get them all organized. And I'm happy to say at least one of them became a biologist out of the University of Guadalajara. Um, I don't know what happened to all of the rest of them, but it was a pretty cool experience to uh, not just give a talk to the local school, but recruit them, teach them some science and uh, teach them some biology. We also recruited um, uh, Enrique Valdez to conduct a what turned into a PhD degree studying the winter ecology of owls in central Mexico. And that involved going out at night and trapping them. We had two study areas, the military base just outside of Guadalajara, and then that hillside near Valencianita uh, in the more central part of Mexico. So again, he used VHF telemetry to track the owls, figure out where they were hunting at night and where they were spending the day. And what we discovered is they were roosting on that hillside I've shown you, but at night they were going down to the lowlands where there was agricultural crop. The top picture is sorghum. Because central Mexico is dry in the winter, the farmers don't have to harvest the crop. There's no snow and like we have here on the prairies. So they could leave the crop growing and then harvest it when they needed it for cattle feed. Well, that allowed mice and insects to proliferate in the crop and then when the crop was cut off, it created instant habitat for the burring owls. 
So literally the night after a, a field had been harvested, the owls would shift their foraging to this new open habitat. And so as that happened over the winter, the owls actually had pretty good situation to, uh, to forage in. A lot of the fields are quite small. They're not the vast fields of Southern Saskatchewan. So the um, small patchy habitat harvesting was, was quite good. Some of the habita other habitats weren't as good. The worst one was in South Texas. The bottom right is a cliche road. There's just a narrow one or two meter wide green patch and then the barren cotton fields. But we actually, we had a third study area in Texas and found the owls were able to forage in that uh, ground, that green patch along the roadside. They cover maybe a kilometer a night, uh, come back to a, a common roost site and, uh, and make a go of it for the winter, but nowhere near as ideal a habitat as we found in central Mexico. They ate a lot of insects in the winter until the frosts occurred. Once there was frost, then the um, uh, owls would switch over to small mammals. So the insects were, were less abundant after a frost. We did find mortality there. Uh, one was killed by a barn owl, one by a short-eared owl. Uh, one ha had a bad habit of roosting in a golf course under development and actually got buried by a bulldozer. And Enrique had to go in with a shovel and dig it out to... Um, to show the, the folks that uh, they'd actually unknowingly, unwittingly, they didn't do it on purpose, obviously, uh, buried a burring owl. So we, we were able to, through that study, determine what is the overwinter survival of burring owls. Oh, I'll get to that in a second. So we also did a lot of education. Um, you can see on the bottom right, the uh, schools that we talked to. On the bottom left are our ratten ears, uh, especially the, the small younger ones on the bottom left. And these were uh, elementary school kids that we found out with slingshots shooting at anything that moved. So we talked to them about not shooting the owls or other birds, explained that they came from Canada, many of them, and they caught on very quickly and didn't do that. And then we, we needed uh, mice, dead mice for baiting our traps and the local pet store just didn't have enough. So we asked the, uh, the kids, where could we get mice? And they said our kitchens. So we gave every kid um, two snap traps. And the next day they both came, they all came back with two mice each. One they caught, uh, sorry, four mice each. One, two they caught before they went to bed and two during the night. So we felt we had a public health uh, benefit as well as uh, getting mice. And of course we paid them roughly the equivalent of uh, 25 cents a mouse. So each kid was earning a dollar a day trapping for us. We also produced a, an educational brochure, the top half of the slide that we distributed, I think about 10,000 to uh, local folks in there. We um, narrowly escaped the, the um, earthquake in Colima. Uh, we had lots of adventures that I can't talk about, found many different roosting situations, both some natural and many unnatural man-made roost sites. But our overwinter survival we found was about 76%. So over the five months of winter, about a quarter of the owls died and three quarters survived. But going back to what was happening in Canada, only about a third of the owls were coming back. So then the question is, where did the rest go? If three quarters survived and only a third of them turned back up in the Regina Plain, where are the missing owls? So what's happening in the spring? We flip back to Jason's study. So what we realized is that the owls that we tracked in the winter using their feather chemistry carried those feathers back in the spring. <coughs> Excuse me. I just have a drink of water here. I'm not used to talking so much. Um, so in fact, by doing uh, the isotope analysis on feathers in the spring, we could estimate where the owl was the previous summer and what its net dispersal was from one year to the next. So what we're doing, the owl went south, we got feathers down there and tracked them back. The ones that we felt were um, started out in Canada. And now we're catching the feather, the, trapping the bird when it comes back in the spring and estimating what its net dispersal is from one year to the next. And what we found was that the mean dispersal was 400 kilometers. So only about a third of the owls came back to within 250 kilometers of their nest site the previous year, two thirds didn't. 
And in fact, we had a couple of owls that had isotope signatures consistent with being in Mexico the previous year. So that's huge dispersal. So basically only a third of the owls are coming back to the Regina Plain. Two thirds are scattering over a much larger landscape. Since Canada's at the Northern edge of the range, that means many of them are actually staying in the US from one year to the next. So what we so we're tracking owls south, we're looking at where do they come back. We collected feathers from, um, our researchers collected feathers for us in the United States, and we estimated that, um, oops, sorry, that um, uh, basically we were losing about 20% per year of our owls. So if you looked at the percentage of owls with a Canadian feather signature in the US versus US owls in Canada, we we're losing about 20% per year. Um, so which also means that we're not getting as many American owls coming north. Fair enough if Canadian owls want to stay south, but if they're not coming north, then we really are losing out. So our first satellite transmitter, remember we tracked it down to Baja, did exactly what we predicted based on stable isotopes. In April, it moved north to uh, northern Baja um, and then turned on again near Denver. So in three nights, it covered 1500 kilometers across the mountains, moved north to Fort Collins on April 19th, and then stayed there in the middle of a prairie dog colony with a pile of other burring owls and nested there for the summer. So it actually stopped a thousand kilometers short of where it successfully bred in Southern Alberta, the one four research station the previous year. So it did exactly what Jason's isotope uh, signature predicted we were going to find, bird short stopping, not necessarily coming back to, uh, to Canada from one year to the next. And other owls did the same thing. One stopped in Montana um, and a couple of them uh, stopped short in the PFRA pastures right along the border, Governor Lock and Reno. So if you look at the core of the burring owl range based on breeding bird surveys, we can see the highest densities are actually in uh, Colorado, um, what's that, Nebraska, Oklahoma, North Texas. Um, that red spot is where the bulk of them are. And what we think, believe is happening is owls are coming north. And if there's suitable habitat in that red area, they'll stop there or they'll keep coming north. And only if they don't find uh, good habitat are they necessarily going to come back to Canada? So of course, there's a lot of skepticism among my colleagues about that. And then in 2003, we caught an owl that was even more remarkable. So the story is that Courtney Conway and his staff trapped a female owl in Arizona on April 30th. She was in a burrow with a male, with a young, with a brood patch that was re-feathering. And we caught her the same summer in July 7th with a different male and six young in Southern Saskatchewan. So she not only dispersed a huge distance, she did it within the same year, 1800 kilometers. Uh, we backdated the age of the young in Saskatchewan. Uh, and from when she was in Arizona, she had about two weeks from when she left, when, when she was trapped in April 30th, um, within two weeks, she had to have been laying eggs in Southern Saskatchewan. So she migrated north very rapidly, found a new male, and actually pulled off a second brood in the same summer. Pretty remarkable record. Oh, yeah, we don't know where, where for sure where she spent the winter. So the proximal cause of the decline of um, owls in Canada is short stopping in the US, but that must be caused by the low productivity of owls in Canada and the US. So that's the ultimate cause of decline. So what do we need to do to produce more burring owls? We need to produce, um, sorry, to save owls, we need to produce more young. And the obvious indication from the research that we've done is supplemental feeding. And so here's a, uh, what, what's uh, gone uh, on in the last six or seven years is uh, Stefano and Michelle in Grasslands National Park agreed to uh, continue a supplemental feeding project that we started before Helen and I retired. So the purpose is to increase the number of young that survived to fledge. They were fed um, 14 mice uh, twice per week, so 28 mice for seven weeks through June, early July. And that provided three times the metabolic requirements of an adult. 
So that gives the adults lots of surplus food to feed their young, just as Troy did. So here's the um, trend analysis uh, for the number of owls. And you can see um, we stopped the decline. And so this project started in 2016. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right here. So we slowed the decline down, actually created a bit of an increase in 2016. But remarkably in 2020, there were 33 pairs and I don't have 21, 2021 graft, but they were in the high 30 pairs of owls. So a dramatic increase in, 20 in, in 2020 and 2021. So although we predict they're, they have high dispersal, 30% of the owls do come back to the a study area and about 5% of the young. So if you produce more young, they're more likely to come back. So that part of the pro project's working. Um, what was the effect of food supplementation? Well, here's the four early uh, first four years, the number of young produced when the nest is fed were 6.3. When they're not fed, it was only 3.3. So similar results to what Troy Wallacombe found in his PhD study, and that trend continued. Um, that's just a graphical um, showing the, 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 the data graphically. And this one's a little bit complicated to follow. Um, but if you look at the last uh, five years up to 2020 and 2021, we'll have a similar bar, the blue lines showing the number of young produced dramatically increased through supplemental feeding. So you can see that the number of um, uh, the average brood size is higher than it has been almost since we started the studies in 1998, thanks to supplemental feeding. And the black line is the number of young, the total number of young produced, which in 2020 hit a record of uh, something over 200 uh, young produced that year through supplemental feeding. So it's fairly inexpensive to do and uh, produces a um, uh, much bigger broods, which is the objective of the, the, process, the project. So how do we conserve boring owls? We continue to conserve habitat, like all the Operation Boring Owl members are doing and all the other stewards in the Nature Saskatchewan programs. And then we recommend that we need to produce more young owls through supplemental feeding. Uh, we believe this could be done through uh, many public programs through Nature Saskatchewan, 4-H, others um, that have owls, if they have a nesting owls, they could be uh, provide, the landowners uh, could be provided with mice. And so long as someone's willing to deliver them to the nest twice a week through June and early July, we could dramatically increase the number of young produced in those nests. Uh, I'll be giving a talk like this to the Raptor Research Foundation in October, encouraging nonprofits in the United States to start similar programs especially in the adjacent states like Montana and North Dakota to um, produce more young that hopefully some of them will come back to Canada, but overall increase the North American population. We've also drafted a, or published a North American conservation plan through the CEC. The picture there is quite an interesting one. So those are our high school students. We came back one fall, they had scraped together the funding for paint and painted this mural on the uh, main wall of the town of Valencianita conservation together. So they clearly got the message that we can all work together to conserve these birds. So that was a very cool uh, mural that the high school arranged. So we published a conservation plan through the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. I haven't checked recently, it should be on their website, cec.org. Uh, of course, they produced it, but there's no commitment to implement it. So the ideas sit there. I'm sure some could be updated. Um, we can only get so far. So in review, the single largest mortality factor in boring owls in the life cycle is a 50% loss of nestlings in the first three weeks after hatch. Supplemental feeding can save most of these nestlings, can save over half of the nestlings uh, that do hatch. So as I said, nestlings were fed twice per week in the month of June, and it could be extended into early July, and that will capture most of those three week periods for most of the pairs of owls. And a large scale program to supplemental feed burying owls, we believe could reverse the decline. So in wrapping up, we thank all the landowners, land managers, and stewards and their livestock for 
uh, conserving boreal habitat. Um, we thank the recovery team and all the people whose activities went into what you've just seen as the result of about 30 years or so of research. One caution to any students that are watching, um, be careful not to study something for too long or you can end up looking like your subject. That was supposed to create laughter. Hopefully it got a smile and thank you for your interest. And if I can figure out how to do it, I will unshare. Okay, thank you, Jeff. That was great. I I definitely laughed. You couldn't okay. hear me, but I was I was laughing. Thank <laughs> that you. That was really good. That was incredibly interesting. Um, I learned so much, and um, I'm sure we could have many many conversations discussing burying owls and the more things that we could do um, here in Saskatchewan to help them out. So thank you so much for taking the time to You're share very welcome. your knowledge with us. Um, okay, so Emily, um, do we have some questions for Jeff? We have um, five minutes uh, for questions. Yeah, so we have a few here. Um, so the first one for you um, are, do the owls migrate singularly or in flocks? We don't know for sure, but I suspect they're on their own. There's uh, indication, certainly, that as a family group, they do not stay together in Alberta and Saskatchewan, they uh, disappear at different times. Uh, by coincidence, they could be migrating on the same nights, but no one's ever encountered a flock of burring owls. There's never been any sort of landing of a flock or anything like that. There was a, a burring owl encountered at 15,000 feet, um, got sucked into a jet and, and um, caused an engine to fail at 15,000 feet. So they can end up flying very high. And from telemetry, we know they can cover at least 350 kilometers a night. So they can also go a long way. Wow. Okay, so likewise, um, in the winter, are they solitary or do they roost in groups? Um, well, they're solitary, but like that hillside I showed you near Valencia Nida, it had up to 40 owls on it. So we think it's more a case of the habitat was ideal for roosting because all those rocks had been turned up by a big plow and all these sedimentary plates had been lifted. And then the, the valley bottom had all this small scale agriculture. Uh, we found some abandoned quarries where we'd find uh, up to 10 or 15 owls uh, on the quarry, in the, in the face of the quarry. Uh, but again, it's sort of like an ideal roosting situation. Um, in Sonora and Sinaloa, where the owls are resident year round, we'd actually find pairs in a burrow together but we think those are resident owls, not necessarily migrant ones. So we, basically they're living a solitary life, but their may, neighbor may not be far away because the, the habitat's ideal for them. Um, oh, wow. Okay, we have a few, a few coming in here. Um, so was there any impact this year with the increase of grasshoppers in the province or is it too soon to tell at this point? To your knowledge, I guess. Uh, yeah, to, my, <laughs> to my knowledge, I don't know. Um, the 2020 results from Grasslands Park showed fairly little, little difference between fed and unfed owls. So the unfed ones also had a good year over six young uh, per nest produced. And so I would guess that was the situation in 2021, but I haven't heard from Stefano about the 21 results. And uh, Helen and I were not able to go there because of COVID. We haven't been able to go the last two years. So um, I'm a little bit out of touch, but Stefano will be sharing his report, I'm sure, when it's ready. Okay, um, I think we have time for another one here. Um, so this question is to do with the supplemental feeding. So is there anything that can be done to enhance the habitat to create more food for the burrowing owls instead of relying on humans for supplemental foods? And as well, as there, is there any like negative uh, side effects to supplemental feeding? Okay, well, the first part, there probably are ways that could be enhanced. Um, as if I remember correctly, Dale Jurdis and I'm not sure if Nature Saskatchewan's involved, tried rolling out a hay bale in one of the pastures in the Regina Plain to see if mice would occupy the hay. And then when the owls came back, there'd be more mice for them to feed on. 
but it was, I, if I remember correctly, it was fairly inconclusive. It's fairly hard to collect data on mouse abundance and you know what's going on at that scale. Um, in terms of the insects, it would be very difficult. So a lot of people don't realize there actually used to be a locust in North America that's now extinct. We hear about locusts in Africa and Asia. There used to be one in North America. The last outbreak of the locust happened near Calgary uh, in 1902-03. And the plague swept east, ate everything green between Calgary and Winnipeg, and then the species disappeared. So it used to be common on the uh, Great Plains so these were big um, five, six inch long locusts and they would have made a nice meal, a nice daily meal for a burring owl, uh, and, but they've been gone for over a hundred years. So that's where the debate as to whether the burring owl is an insectivore or a small mammal uh, eater. So the ideal would be to have an abundance of mice, voles or uh, insects, but how to do that is problematic. And I haven't heard of any ideas other than unrolling hay bales. The, the one possible downside, and this happened in uh, 2012, I think, in Grasslands Park, is there is a risk of, um, uh, uh, what's the word, attracting uh, uh, predators to a nest where we're putting down a lot of uh, food. So there we had volunteers helping. Uh, we feel that in some cases they were actually putting mice down a hole that didn't have owls in and badgers and mat pies caught on. Uh, the other thing we've implemented since then is the mice are put in with a long probe. So like a snake catcher or a golf ball catcher. So they're put down the hole about two feet. So they're not visible or easily accessible to birds like magpies or ravens. So that by, and I don't believe that Stefano encountered any problems with predators in the more recent years. Okay, well, I think that's all the time we have. Um, if your question didn't get answered, I'm sure we can pass them along and get the answer to you sure. somehow. Awesome, okay, thanks Emily. And thank you, Jeff, again, for sharing your knowledge with us tonight. It was really, really fascinating. Thank you yep. so much for being here. You're very welcome. Okay. Thank you. So next, um, our last speaker tonight is um, Katie Lynn Bunny, and she's joining us from Monarch Joint Venture. Uh, Katie Lynn coordinates Monarch Joint Venture's education and outreach programs, which include professional development programs for teachers and educators, local programming, and the MJV NC NCTC conservation webinar series. She also works to connect partners and the public to the resources they need for monarch conservation and education. In addition to these roles, Katie Lynn also co-plans the annual partner meeting and coordinates the MJV's Monarch Store. Katie Lynn enjoys the opportunities MJV has to work with so many devoted people and interested in promoting conservation and education. She loves having such an integral role in providing them with the tools and skills they are seeking. And in her free time, she can be found hiking, camping, reading, knitting, and spending time with her family. So with that, Katie Lynn, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And the floor is yours. Thanks so much. And thank you everyone for uh, joining tonight. Um, that was such a fascinating talk on burrowing owls. We don't have burrowing owls where I am. <laughs> they're, they're fascinating. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Monarch Joint Venture, we are based in St. Paul, Minnesota, so I'm south of all of you all in the United States, um, but uh, monarchs are a North American species, so they, they don't care about political boundaries, so we're, we're going to talk about monarch migration tonight. Um, as mentioned, I'm the education coordinator for the Monarch Joint Venture. Um, MJV is a nonprofit organization working to conserve the monarch butterfly and its migration. And sorry, my slides, here we go. So we work together with our partners to protect this really iconic insect. Uh, monarchs are one of the most recognized insects in North America. There are, um, you know, hundreds of different species of butterflies here, but uh, not everybody can say that that's a, you know, a specific type of swallowtail or a specific type of skipperling or something like that. But 
most people I encounter, if they show them a picture of this butterfly here, they could say, yeah, that's a monarch butterfly because they recognize it and know what it is. MJV has over 100 partners. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> MJV has over 100 partners from across the United States, across different sectors working in some way, shape or form to conserve the monarch butterfly. And that happens through habitat, education uh, and research. So you'll notice all of these are US-based. MJV is a US-based organization. So all of our official partners are uh, based here in the US. However, we do work very closely with colleagues in Canada and Mexico because like I said, monarchs cross political boundaries. So we, our work also has to cross political boundaries. MJV's work is based on, and all of our goals are based on the North American Monarch Conservation Plan, which was written in 2018. Uh, or sorry, 2008, wrong decade. <laughs> so it was written in 2008. Um, and then every year we work with our partners to update the Monarch Conservation Implementation Plan. And you can find both of these documents on the Monarch Joint Venture website if you're interested in reading more about them. But essentially they just outline the work that needs to happen to protect this species. And like I mentioned, we do this work in, in really four different areas, um, primarily habitat, education, and science, but that all centers around partnership. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without all of our partners. So the goal of the Monarch Joint Venture is to be the information clearinghouse for all things monarchs and provide resources not only to our partners, but to the public as well. So if there's anything that you want to know about monarch conservation, our hope is that you'll be able to find it on our website. And if it's not there, we know where to find it or it's being worked on to get there. And we have so many different resources on our website from uh, you know, different pages for specific audiences to program pages to um, our, our conservation webinar series, our resources pages, free downloadable handouts, and like I said, we're always updating things um, throughout, <clears throat> throughout the year to make sure that our information is up to date. But the work that we do is all centered around the monarch butterfly. We use monarchs as a flagship for conservation to protect the environment. <clears throat> as I said, monarchs are easily recognizable. They're um, very well known, very charismatic, um, and, and really, relatively simple to study compared to most insects. Um, but the nice thing about them, one of the great things about them is that they share the same habitat with many other insects and other important pollinators. So <clears throat> what you do for monarch butterflies is also helping other species, uh, not just pollinators, but native birds, native mammals, native um, uh, and other native insects, things that aren't necessarily pollinators, but still important for the food web. <clears throat> So the monarch life cycle is the same as any other lepidopter and any other butterfly or moth, egg, caterpillar, pupa, adult, but that all centers around a specific plant called milkweed. Milkweed is the monarch's only host plant, which means that it's the only thing that the caterpillars will recognize as a food source and the only thing that the females will lay their eggs on. <clears throat> if we don't have milkweed, we don't have monarchs. It's just not possible. They won't, they won't eat anything else. <clears throat> But they also have this really spectacular migration, which is what we'll talk about for the most part <clears throat> a little bit later here. But you can see they span most of um, the central part of North America. They do get up into Saskatchewan, um, not quite as far north as, um, <clears throat> as some species do, but they do, um, they, they're basically found anywhere where, where milkweed is found. So if you have milkweed in your area, you could have monarchs there. <clears throat> And you'll notice there are um, really three distinct populations of monarchs. We have the Eastern monarch population, we have the Western monarch population, and then we have this non-migratory population that's found in Florida. The weather's nice there, there's lots of milkweed there, so they stick around for the year. Um, <clears throat> as far as where monarchs from Saskatchewan go, 
it, it's most likely that they go south to Mexico because of, you know, the continental divide and the mountains are in the way, but it's also entirely possible that occasionally some of them might end up on the coast of California. But for the most part, all the monarchs east of the Rocky Mountains will head south to Mexico, and most of the monarchs west of the Rocky Mountains will head to the coast of California to spend the winter. Now there is some intermixing. We know for a fact based on some tagging information from the Southwest Monarch Study, which is based in Arizona, that some monarchs that they've tagged have been found in Mexico and some have been found on the coast of California. So we know that they, um, they can go either way and it's most likely dependent on the weather and which way the winds are blowing. <clears throat> so, it's quite the spectacular migration, and I'll talk more about the ins and outs of that, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page as far as the general life cycle. Monarchs, as I mentioned, use milkweed as their only host plant, but there are over 100 species of milkweed found across North America. All of them have um, some of the same characteristics. They all have this sort of star-shaped flower with, um, we call them hoods, with these petals here and then kind of a horn or a claw-like structure coming out of it and pointing towards the center. All of them produce seed pods. Some of them are much more bulbous, some of them are more narrow, but they all have this sort of general shape to it. And they all produce seeds. Most of them are airborne. Um, they are dispersed by wind. There's one species which I'm pretty sure is not found in Canada or the Northern United States. Um, it's a southeastern species called aquatic milkweed. It's the only one that I know of that does not produce these little white tufts of silk. Um, it, it disperses on the surface of water. So the seeds, the pods burst open and the seeds float off onto um, shorelines around whatever body of water it's growing next to. So they all have these similar characteristics. They, most of them also have milky sap, which is how it gets its name. They're all in the genus Asclepius, but they have so much variety in them. And I'm showing some species that are found throughout, um, throughout different parts of North America. The rush milkweed, Asclepia subulata, is found in the desert southwest. World milkweed can be found throughout um, eastern U.S. Same with the swamp milkweed or rose milkweed. Then there's white milkweed. So you'll see there's a huge variation in how the flowers are growing the shapes of the flower, um, the umbels of the flowers, and then even the color. And then um, even the number of flowers on those umbels. There, you know, there's just, it looks a little more sparse here in this Asclepius amplexicollis compared to butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa. Um, you know, there's just a, you know, a huge amount of variety. So there's really something for everybody if you're looking to plant a native pollinator habitat. And monarchs will lay their eggs on any part of the milkweed plant, from the stem to the undersides of the leaves to the clusters of the flowers. So if you're looking for monarchs in, in your yard, in your garden, in your natural spaces, really look everywhere, especially when the milkweed is in bloom or getting ready to bloom when it's in its bud phase here. Um, you can find the, the eggs within those and the caterpillars as they develop within those clusters of flowers. <clears throat> so the, leg, the eggs take about three to five days to hatch. And then every few days after that, the caterpillar will shed its skin um, into a new stage of caterpillar. But when they first hatch, they're very, very small. The eggs are only about the size of a pinhead. So the caterpillar that comes out of it is also very tiny. Um, most people don't start to see ca the monarch caterpillars until they're in their fourth or fifth instar, in their in their fifth, fourth or fifth stage of their caterpillar phase, but um, they're they're there. Uh, <clears throat> you just might not see them right away. They start getting more and more stripes as they um, as they age. Again, molting every few days, and they will turn around and eat their old skin after they've molted, just to deter predators from finding them. And then finally, when, they're, when they've reached the end of their caterpillar stage, when they've eaten their fill, which takes somewhere between, you know, 10 to 14 days, we say about two weeks, uh, they'll leave the milkweed plant and go off and find a safe place to form their chrysalis. 
And in that time, in that two week period, from the time that they hatch from this thing, the size of a pinhead to the time they're ready to form their chrysalis, they've grown 2000 times their original size, which would be the equivalent of a human infant growing to a size, to the size of an elephant in about two weeks, which is just astronomical amount of growth. Um, it's a lot of food. It's a lot of waste. It's, um, you can see all the little dots in here. That's caterpillar poop. Uh, it's called frass. <laughs> so there it's just a huge amount of change taking place in such a short period of time. But even more change is about to happen. So they'll leave the milkweed plant and hang upside down in this J shape. We call this the J stage of the caterpillar. They've spun a silk button up here. You can see it on the leaf here on this chrysalis here but they'll, they'll hang upside down for several hours like this and then split their skin one last time to form the pupa, the chrysalis. And they'll do this anywhere. Very rarely will it happen on the milkweed plants. Um, this one is in a milkweed patch, but the plant it's on is not milkweed. This was next to a field um, that I didn't see any milkweed in, but there must have been because the pupa is here. And the only reason I saw either of these is because I got lucky. Um, this one on the left, it just happened to be a very um, overcast rainy day. You can see the rain kind of dripping off this caterpillar here. Um, and it hadn't transformed yet. It hadn't pupated. So I could see its bright stripes there uh, as I was walking past. And the only reason I saw this one is because I just happened to park my car next to it and I opened my door and that was the first thing I saw. So they are very well camouflaged. They're very good at finding safe places for themselves to, to form their chrysalises. But this transformation is really fascinating to watch <clears throat> if you ever get the opportunity because they literally split their skin right down their back. They kind of shimmy their old caterpillar skin up their body. And then this, this appendage here, this cremaster, which is that stem-like stru structure that inserts itself into the, the silk button there um, that's inside the body of the caterpillar. So someone once described this process of me of having to insert this cream master into the silk button as hanging onto a, like a monkey bar with a gloved hand, one-handed, and then having to remove that glove without losing your grip on the, on the, on the monkey bars. Um, so it's, extremely precarious. This is an extremely vulnerable stage. They're no longer mobile. I mean, they move a little bit, but they can't move around like escaping predators or anything like that. Um, which is why this camouflage is so important. And another reason why they leave the milkweed plant because the milkweed plant is covered in predators. So from this upper left um, to the second from the right on the top, it takes about three minutes or so to get from here to here. And then over the next half an hour, the, the pupa will scrunch up this part of its body here up into the top mm, about third, 30 to 40% of its body here. And then its exoskeleton will start hardening into the shape and color of the pupa that we recognize as the monarch chrysalis. And then it just sits there for another two weeks. It doesn't do anything, it's still breathing, but it's, um, it's not able to eliminate any of its waste. It's not able to eat anything. It's not able to escape predators. It's a sitting duck, right? So if, if something were to come across and see this, the, the only defense this pupa now has is whatever toxins it has sequestered from, um, from the, the milkweed that it ate as a caterpillar. So that toxin can protect it from some predators, but not all. So it's really important that it finds a safe place that's well camouflaged from, uh, from predators. The pupa stage lasts about two weeks, again, somewhere between nine to 14 days, 10 to 14 days, somewhere around there under normal summer temperatures, average summer temperatures. And then just before it's ready to come out of the pupa, about a day beforehand, you'll start to see the pigment of the butterfly start to show through. And then you know it's about ready. Um, and the butterfly just kind of pops right out, plumps its, its abdomen on um, outside of the, the pupa casing here. And then you'll notice that the abdomen is quite plump and the wings are very small and kind of wrinkled. So it, um, 
from from about here to here, it's maybe like 20 to 30 seconds. Um, and then once it's out, it, it'll situate itself. So its wings are hanging behind itself. And then it'll pulse its abdomen, almost like a heartbeat to push the fluids that are in the abdomen out into the wings to fully inflate them. Um, and then it'll take another four or five hours for those wings to dry enough for that butterfly to fly away. And then we have our, our adult butterflies. We've got the female on the left and the male on the right. And I'll point out the, the thing that uh, differentiates them. The male has these two spots on the outer, um, on the hind wings on either side of the abdomen. You can see one here on the left and one on the right that is not present on the female. And the other thing to note between the two usually, and these aren't the same contrast in colors here, but usually the female is slightly duller orange and the male is more is a little bit brighter. And then the veins on the female are a little bit thicker than those of the male. Um, but those can be often difficult to tell. Those, those two traits can be difficult to tell unless they're side by side. So really um, the best way to tell them apart is to look for these two dots on their abdomen there. <clears throat> so monarchs also do this really cool migration thing that we're talking about tonight. Um, they have one of the most spectacular migrations on the planet. They can fly up to 3000 miles to central Mexico to spend the winter there. So right around now, this time of year, I think monarchs in Saskatchewan have probably already left the area or should have left the area. They're just leaving Minnesota now. We're at the very tail end of the migration where I'm at in the Twin Cities area. Um, so they, uh, this last generation of the summer is, is the generation that migrates to Mexico. So normally the butterflies that we see around the summer in the prairie, um, in, in the summer in the prairie, live about a month, we say somewhere between three to six weeks. But the monarchs that are migrating right now are part of the super generation and they can live up to nine months. So they are physiologically different than the monarchs that we have here in the summer. Outwardly, they look the same, but inwards, um, their, their reproductive organs have not fully matured yet. So they're in a state of reproductive diapause, which just means that they're delaying mating, they're delaying reproduction until conditions are more favorable for that process. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because winter in the North is really harsh, especially for a little tiny insect. There's no food sources available. There's no milkweed for them to lay their eggs on. So by migrating and waiting until conditions are more favorable, they are giving their offsprings, their offspring a much better chance of survival. So this generation is flying south to Mexico. They'll roost along the way, drink nectar along the way. And these roosts can range, and these are, were both taken in, Minis in Minnesota, but these roosts can range from a few dozen to just a handful to several thousand, depending on how many, um, or. Well, yeah, depending on how many monarchs are around that year, but also where they are in their migration. Here in the north, we tend to not get super high um, or super large roosts um, compared to places like Texas or somewhere along the Gulf Coast. Because when you think about it, every single monarch that goes to Mexico has to go through Texas to get there, or most of them. So Texas tends to get pretty large roosts, um, especially if there's a cold front that keeps the monarchs in one spot for a while. So that overwintering generation lives up to nine months. They migrate to central Mexico. And this, so this map is in Spanish, but um, uh, the overwintering sites are in the mountains of central Mexico, west of Me Mexico City, in the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve, which is along the, the transvolcanic um, mountain range, the, the Sierra Madres in central Mexico. And there are several mountaintops where the monarchs have been found historically, they're denoted by, so the mountains are, um, they're all named. Uh, you can see El Rosario right here. This is the largest of the roosts um, pretty much every year. And then there's some smaller mountains along, um, along the mountain range here. And then in California, um, monarchs will roost in much smaller sites 
all along the entire coast. So from Mendocino all the way down to Tijuana, um, they will, oops, did not mean to go back. Uh, they'll roost in upwards, I think there's like 450 sites that have been, or sorry, 200, over 200 sites that have been officially recorded along 450 miles of the coast, um, historically. Now, while monarchs are overwintering, they're not really doing a whole lot. So they're just kind of biding their time, waiting for conditions to be right again for their migration north. Um, this is what their clusters look like in Mexico. There's anywhere between five to 15 colonies that range in, um, in size, anywhere from just a few trees to a few acres. And so each one of these clusters, I know from this distance, it looks like dead leaves or pine cones, but these are all monarch butterflies um, in dense clusters, just like this, huddling together, to trap heat when they can, you know, central Mexico. I know a lot of us here in the North, we think Mexico is sunny and warm and full of beaches and, and a great place to vacation when it's cold and snowy, but it's not that warm on the mountaintops of central Mexico. It's actually quite cold. Um, somewhere between, you know, sometimes it gets down into, and I'm gonna talk in Fahrenheit because my brain can't handle Celsius right now, but somewhere between like, 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 55 to 60 degrees, maybe 70 degrees in the warmer um, as, as spring approaches. But most of the time, it's about the same temperature as your refrigerator. Um, you know, not too hot, not too cold. And those are the conditions that monarchs seek out no matter where they're going to overwinter. If it were too hot, they would burn through their fat stores that they built up during the migration. But if it were too cold, they would freeze. Um, and monarchs can handle some freezing temperatures, but not for prolonged periods of time, and definitely not if they're wet. So for the most part, they're just kind of hanging out, literally, in the trees. Uh, they might come down from the trees and drink water from streams, from puddles, from dew, things like that. On warm days, they might fly around and stretch their wings. As spring approaches and more flowers become available, they might um, drink nectar. But for most of the winter, they are, they're clustered in those dense clusters. Um, and then as the, as the days get longer, as the sun shines brighter and uh, temperatures rise and more flowers become available, they receive all of those cues from nature to begin the migration north again. So the monarchs that are leaving us in the north here make it all the way to Mexico in one go. I mean, they stop in nectar along the way. They'll, they'll um, stop in roosts, in small roosts along the way, but they don't mate until conditions are right again in the spring. So as they're migrating northward in the spring, some of them look like this. They don't always look um, very pretty <laughs> anymore because they've just spent the entire winter. They flew... 3,000 miles south, spent several months, you know, six months in, in um, Mexico overwintering, but they'll mate along the way and lay eggs whenever they find milkweed as they leave central Mexico and head north through Mexico and into Texas and other parts of the southern U.S. And then the same, a similar thing is happening in California, but usually a little bit earlier, sometime in February is when they leave and they'll lay eggs in the Central Valley of California. And they'll lay eggs on plants that are only a couple of inches tall. Um, you know, this is a, I'm forgetting the name of this milkweed, but this is a California species of milkweed. Um, but they'll, they'll lay eggs on milkweed that's just barely out of the ground. <clears throat> so to recap the annual cycle of monarchs, the monarchs that are leaving us right now in the North fly one leg of the migration southward in one go. They leave us sometime in August. They spend November through March overwintering in Mexico. This is the fourth generation of the year, sometimes the fifth, but usually just the fourth generation that we've seen in, throughout the year. They'll spend their winters in Mexico or the, on the coast of California. As spring comes and warms things up a little, they fly northward into um, Central California, Central Valley of California into Southern US, lay their eggs, 
and then they die. They've reached the end of their life spring. They fulfilled their biological purpose to um, create a new generation. And then that generation becomes the first generation of the year. That generation, those eggs that are laid in the southern part of the U.S. and the Central Valley of California, they, as uh, once they grow up, they complete the migration northward, again, mating and laying eggs along the way. And then we see two to three generations of breeding monarchs in the summer. We, and I'll, I'll use Minnesota as a reference. We get monarchs returning to us sometime in late May or early June. So we see a peak of egg laying in June. We see another peak in July. And then we see another peak in August. And it's that August generation of eggs that will be the super generation of monarchs that completes the, um, the full cycle of the annual migration. So in all, monarchs need some pretty specific things to complete their life cycle. They need milkweed to just develop as, as butterflies but they need nectar sources to feed on as adults. And then also as adults, they need safe places to roost during the migration and safe places to roost during their overwintering period. But the fact that they all go to the same place year after year without fail makes it really easy to estimate the population. And there aren't very many organisms on the planet that that can be said for. Um, but all of the monarchs that are, or all of the trees that are orange on this photo are orange because they're covered in monarch butterflies. So we can estimate their population pretty easily. Scientists in Mexico will kind of geotag all of the trees that have monarchs in them and then use some GIS software to measure the area that those trees take up. And then we get these really cool graphs. Adding up the area that all that monarchs are occupying in Mexico in hectares, this is in hectares. Um, and we've been doing this since the winter of 1993, 1994. We being like the collective we in the monarch conservation world. Um, world Wildlife Fund Mexico is the one that um, coordinates the, the training or the, the counting right now. So and I, I blocked off the second part of this map or graph because I want to I want to point out a few things here. You'll see that there's a lot of fluctuation here. You know, there was one big year in the winter of 1996 and 1997. There was a low year in the winter of 2004 and 2005, and another low year in 12, 2000 to 2001. These were both years, I, if I'm recalling correctly, that had um, pretty low or uh, pretty bad winter storms. But if I reveal the second part of this graph, you'll notice that the numbers don't really get above six hectares past, you know, winter of 2006 to 2007. And if, I don't need to put a trend line on this graph for you to see that monarchs are in decline. The Eastern monarch population is declining. Um, and we know the reasons, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and I, no, I don't know what the numbers will look like for 2021, 2022 yet. We don't get the official count until sometime between January and March. Um, some scientists think it'll be about the same as last year. Some of us are a little bit more hopeful that it'll be a little bit more, but there was a lot of drought in the Midwest and a lot of flooding in the Southern parts. And then that really bad winter storm um, or early spring storm in Texas, that ice storm um, also had an effect on lots of insect populations. So I don't know what things will look like this year and I won't know for another few months yet. But I do wanna point out that the Western monarch population is in even more dire straits than the Eastern population. Western monarchs are counted a little bit differently because there have always been fewer of them um, and they're more spread out. So they're counted, they're estimated by total monarch abundance. They're estimated by individual. Um, and so for, for most of the last couple of decades, they've hovered somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 individual monarchs. But you'll also notice this blue line here is the number of sites monitored to get these green bars. And in 2020, just this past winter, you know, 2020 kind of sucked all around. <laughs> um, but in 2020, this past winter, there were fewer than 2,000 individual monarch butterflies found along the entire coast of California. That's over 450 sites that, um, or sorry, 250 sites that volunteers went to to count individual monarchs. 
So Western monarchs need our help just as much as Eastern monarchs. And there are a few things that are in play here. And as always with anything, there are natural threats. This is a natural part of any ecosystem. There will always be predators, there will always be parasites, and there will always be weather that organisms have to contend with. And monarchs have many natural causes of, de of death. And, and we know that only about two to 5% of the eggs laid make it to adulthood. And that's normal, that's natural. If you look at any organism on the planet that has hundreds of eggs laid in a brood, there's a reason that they lay hundreds of eggs and it's because not very many of them survive. So like fish, crustaceans, other arthropods, um, even reptiles, you know, you look at alligators and sea turtles, they lay hundreds of eggs as well. And also because not very many of them will survive. So the threats that we need to be thinking about are the human driven th threats like habitat loss and climate change. And in some areas, the use of pesticides. Um, so we know that loss of breeding habitat and hotter weather are associated with lower monarch populations and the data are there to back it up. Um, you can look at the, at the MJV website for some of those resources, but we know that those things are, are a leading cause of decline of insect populations across the world. And I mentioned some of those winter storms from earlier in the 2000s. And if you remember, I also said monarchs can't survive freezing temperatures if they're wet. Climate change is having a huge effect on monarchs. Um, in, in not only in their overwintering sites of, on the coast of California and Mexico, because colder, wetter storms are becoming more common, but also fire. Um, wildfires in the West are a huge concern, not just for people, but for wildlife. And they're becoming hotter, they're becoming larger, they're becoming more frequent. Fire season is becoming longer. So it's really um, imperative that we do things to curb the effects of climate change. And I know a lot of this was really kind of depressing information. So we're gonna end on a hopeful note. Um, there are things that we can do to help monarch butterflies. My slides will advance, here we go. Remember that we have the support of many organizations, not just here in the United States, but there are groups in Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada and the Insectarium of Montreal are two groups in particular, as well as the, the CEC, the conservation, um, oh gosh, thinking other name, the CEC that Jeff mentioned too. They're also working on monarch stuff. And then there are groups in Mexico, World Wildlife Fund Mexico, um, uh, Fondo Monarca, Correo Real, and, and a couple of others that I'm, I'm forgetting. But organizations across North America are all working together to protect monarch butterflies. But what can you do? What are things that you can do at home, at work, at school, wherever you might be? The first thing that you you can do, you've already started. You're exploring, you're learning more about monarch butterflies and you can learn more on the MJV website. You can go out and find a milkweed plant and just observe it, see what lives on that plant besides just monarchs. Um, take some time to, to explore your natural surroundings to see what else is there. The best thing though, that you can do to help monarch butterflies is to plant habitat. And this habitat benefits all pollinators through continuous bloom, diversity of plants, um, and diversity of native plants. Pollinator plantings provide host plants for lepidopterans, butterflies and moths, but also nesting sites for native bees and nectar sources for all sorts of pollinators. So those three things especially are important. So really the whole point of it is to provide homes and foods for native bees and butterflies and moths. And native bees can be ground nesting, they can be cavity nesting, they can you know, create nests in, in piles of dried leaves and grass. Um, and then of course, larval forage, which are included in that host plant. I've mentioned that there are over a hundred species of milkweed that are native to North America. You wanna look for what's native to your region in any local native plant guides. And I'm gonna share some resources um, with Nature Saskatchewan to send out in a follow-up email with all of this information. Um, so the Xerxes Society Pollinator Partnership, the David Suzuki Foundation, um, National Wildlife Federation, they all have plant resources. And then um, this screenshot here is from the Monarch Joint Venture. Our, our um, vendor map has information on, on um, native plant stores. It's not comprehensive. It's just kind of a, a thing that vendors can tell us that they have milkweed seeds and then we can add them to their map. 
So if you know of any in Saskatchewan, send them our way, we'll add them to our map. And it's less of a concern in northern areas where we are, but um, we encourage you to avoid tropical milkweed. It's not native to most of North America. And in areas where the weather is more mild year round, it, it, it stays green because it's tropical. It doesn't senesce like native plants um, in the North do. Um, and because of that, it can perpetuate disease and encourage winter breeding where monarchs should be migrating. And then the other thing to look out for are um, pesticides, systemic pesticides like neonicotinoids because they can be sneaky in how they're advertised as beneficial for your plants. And yes, they're beneficial for your plants, but what these don't say is that they're also going to harm beneficial insects. And next really great thing that you can do to help monarchs is to, uh, to contribute to monarch citizen or community science. And I'm putting a few up here. Um, the Insectarium of Montreal runs the Mission Monarch program, which is something that you can do locally in Canada. But the rest of these programs are international um, throughout North America. So Journey North tracks the migration based on sightings. The Monarch Larva Monitoring Project asks volunteers to report eggs and larval sightings and um, weekly counts of larval densities on milkweed plants. Monarch Watch does the tagging program, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. And then um, Project Monarch Health looks at a specific disease called Ophriocystis electroscira, OE for short. Um, and you can find more information on all of these on their websites. But Monarch Watch is actually um, a continuation of the program of um, tagging that Fred Urquhart, who's native to Canada, um, he, he's uh, from Toronto, I believe, uh, but he started the Insect Migration Association um, back in the late 60s, early 70s, and his program is how Western science discovered the existence of the overwintering sites in Mexico. And you can learn more about that. Um, there's a National Geographic article, August of 1976, that you can look up. Um, but the Flight of the Butterflies filmed uh, fl film is also a really fun way to watch that story. It's, um, it's about 40 minutes long, 44 minutes. But just know that someone somewhere is monitoring a part of the monarch life cycle at any given point in the year. They're probably one of the most heavily monitored organisms in North America, just because of um, how many programs exist for watching them. Um, another thing that you can do as with any conservation initiative is to donate, um, whether that's time or money or resources to a conservation organization uh, that can then amplify all of that into um, even more work across a larger scale, a larger spatial scale. And then finally, um, I don't think this is one that is, is touted enough, but connecting and sharing with other people. And this can be elected officials, this can be your local school board, this can be your school, your neighbors, your neighborhood association, your local community, um, your family, really anyone. Um, it, just connecting and sharing and spreading the word about what can be done for monarchs and other pollinators um, can make a really big difference. Um, and just remember that monarchs can be a really engaging experience for all ages, teachers, students, small children, all the way on up through, uh, you know, we, somebody I used to work with called it pre-K to gray. And really anyone um, who isn't afraid of insects or who doesn't have like a, a severe phobia of butterflies, which I have encountered, um, has something to experience from watching the butterfly life cycle or observing even just a small portion of it. Um, and, and then to take it on another even more hopeful note and just know that we can make a difference. We are making a difference. Every little bit adds up. And I think I'm at 40 minutes almost exactly. So <laughs> if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, and if we don't get to them all tonight, I'm Caitlin, I'm, I'm happy to, um, answer them through email as well. Um, great. Uh, thank you, Katie Lynn. That was fantastic. Very, very great information and beautiful photos. It was, it was a stunning presentation. Um, Emily, do we have a couple questions for Katie Lynn? 
We do. Um, so we have a couple, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer being in the U.S., but about uh, milkweed species specific to Saskatchewan. Um, so if you don't know, I, I do, so I throw my answer yeah, in there. <laughs> I know that there are some species similar, you know, I know common milkweed is common everywhere, um, or at least in a lot of places, um, but Saskatchewan is like two provinces west of me so I can't even say that hey a lot of what's native to Minnesota would be native to there because I don't think that's true um so I'll I'll, I'll punt that to you Emily <laughs> yeah so we so anybody interested we do have six species of milkweed and um a lot of them are very rare in Saskatchewan but there's a few that are more common and you can actually buy seeds at um like Prairie Originals or Blazing Star uh, are two native plant centers that are nearby Okay, I think th there's a couple people that asked that, so just covering all their questions. Um, so, uh, has there been any documented sightings of more than one egg on milkweed, on yep, a yep. milkweed plant? Definitely, yeah, and that does happen, um, and it happens pretty frequently. Um, I have, <laughs> I was monitoring, um, I was doing a monarch larva monitoring project training in Milwaukee, Wisconsin probably four or five years ago now. And I found 20 monarchs on one plant. So it does happen. It tends to happen more often when the milkweed is small, still be, just before it's, you know, really kind of burst up out of the ground. So really it's a scarcity thing. Um, and it's been documented in places where um, even when the milkweed is fully out of the ground and flowering and it's the middle of the season, but there's not a lot of it, People have documented a uh, female visiting all the milkweed once, laying an egg on each one, and then coming back and laying more eggs. Um, so it does happen. It doesn't always mean that they're all related. It could be more than one monarch laying eggs on the same plant, uh, but it does happen. Okay. Um, so when there are fires, for example, in California, um, do groups go and replant the areas where there was milkweed so that the monarch migration is less disrupted? That is an excellent question. Um, I don't know the answer to that specifically for milkweed um, or really any plants in, in the West uh, because I'm in the Midwest. I'm in a prairie state and fire here is more com more natural uh, way of replenishing our ecosystems. Um, in the West, the way that humans have developed the land and, and used the land has kind of taken away the usefulness of fire. Um, now fire is more of a danger than, um, than a, a life bringer that it used to be. Um, so I, I'm, I would have to check with some of my Western state colleagues to, to know that answer for sure if, if they do go replant. I know many fire adapted species don't need to be replanted, just like a lot of prairie species, they'll come up after, um, after the danger has passed, they'll re-germinate. Um, but I can, I can certainly ask that of some Western colleagues. Um. So if a monarch emerged from its chrysalis uh, today, um, how long would it take to reach its wintering ground? Um, that is an excellent question. And it varies due to weather um, and temperature. So if it emerged today, and of course latitude, a monarch that emerged in Texas Obviously, it won't take as long to get to Mexico as one that emerges in Canada or um, a northern state. On average, it takes about six to eight weeks to get to Mexico. Um, so here in Minnesota, like I mentioned earlier, monarchs are kind of on their way out. We're seeing just the very tail end of the monarchs here in Minnesota. So if I were to see a monarch caterpillar right now, I would assume that it would not complete the migration because um, the weather here in Minnesota is starting to get really cold. So it's going to take longer to develop. And by the time it is an adult, it's going to be too cold for it to fly. Uh, monarchs need to, um, their flight muscles need to be about 55 degrees Fahrenheit in order for them to fly. So if they, uh, if the temperatures drop below that, they won't be able to, to really go anywhere. Um, 
but on average, it's about six to eight weeks, uh, about 50 miles or so a day, give or take. Um, that, the greatest number documented, not necessarily ever, but the greatest number documented of miles in one day is about 150. And we know that because somebody tagged a monarch in one place and then it was recovered the next day, 150 miles away. And that was probably with a tailwind. <laughs> so if they have a tailwind, they can go much further. Uh, but otherwise they just kind of lock their wings like a raptor would and soar. Um, they're very efficient flyers. Um, Caitlin, do we have time for one more or a few more? Yeah, we can do, let's do one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Um, so do you have an estimate of the total North American population of monarch butterflies? Individuals, no. Um, we, that, that's a really difficult thing to estimate by individuals just because the clusters of monarchs are vary in density, both in California and Mexico, but they vary in density. Um, so it's hard to tell exactly how many are, um, are in an individual cluster. I, I think that there was a, an estimate at some point that I heard that one human size, adult human size torso cluster held like, Oh gosh, I'm, I feel like I'm going to get this wrong. Um, held maybe 2,000 monarchs. I'm going to look that up too. Um, <laughs> oh. So I know that there is research and, and technology being developed to help estimate that a little bit better. But with a, with a population that um, spread so far, the the really the best place to count them is when they're all in one place in Mexico um and they're you know they're not you know at, at eye height they're they're hundreds of feet up in trees um so it's it's difficult to estimate that we know it's in the millions still um we just don't know how many millions okay well there's there's a couple others that I'm sure we'll get to you um to answer at some point <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Um, and thank you, Katie Lynn, for taking the time tonight to be with us um, and sharing your knowledge of monarch butterflies. That was great. My pleasure. So um, that's it for tonight. So uh, thank you everyone for taking um, this migration journey with us tonight. And we hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Um, we do, of course, have a short survey um, if you would, wouldn't mind just taking a quick minute to complete it. Um, I believe it will, it will pop up when you leave the webinar, um, but otherwise we'll also be sending a link um, in an email afterwards. So that's it from, from all of us here at uh, Nature Saskatchewan. And again, thank you to our speakers for being with us tonight and thank you and good night. <laughs>